Hi, very good morning or good afternoon to all of you. I'm Ivan, the Scientific Affairs Manager of Severe APEC. Today we'll be talking about thalassemia and also importantly, the clinical diagnosis of uh, thalassemia by capillary electrophoresis. I welcome you to post your questions throughout the webinar in the questions chat box. Uh, should time not allow me to answer your questions, please feel free to reach out to me uh, via my email. All right, thank you so much for your time uh, to attend this webinar today. Okay, to, to best appreciate and interpret thalassemia results, you must always have the base understanding of the hemoglobin molecule. All right, so the hemoglobin molecule is made up of two alpha chains and two other globin chains of hemoglobin types, which could be beta, delta, or gamma. And there is a heme group within this each of the globin chains, which is where the iron is present to bind and transport your oxygen. This is a schematic uh, diagram about hemoglobin. So always remember that there are more alpha genes, okay, lesser beta and delta genes, and also uh, more gamma genes. Okay, a 4, 2, 2, 4. Always remember this number. And because this will be the basis to understand whether there are enough genes to buffer for a deficit of globin chains. So alpha chains will be produced and then they will bind largely to the beta chains to give you the majority hemoglobin, your hemoglobin A. If you look at the capillary electrophoretogram on the right, you will see that the hemoglobin A is a predominant species, right? And Hemoglobin A2, which is made up of delta chains in combination with alpha chains, made up a small proportion of population of hemoglobins. And likewise, hemoglobin F is also produced in small amounts. In times, it may not be present to be visibly detected. So as are all hemoglobinopathy type of disorders, the passing down of the disease genes always happens through the heterozygous format. So parents who could appear healthy with no clinical symptoms could potentially harbor half of the disease genes. And this results in the passing down to uh, potentially a 25% chance of a child having the hemoglobin disorder. Also, offsprings could remain a carrier within the population, hence explaining why disease can remain endemic in such populations for a long period of time. Let's look at the hemoglobin fractions in the normal adult. So predominantly, hemoglobin A would be the majority population with a range of about 96.7 to 97.8% major fraction. But I always remember what are the major fractions and what are the smaller fractions. Hemoglobin A2 will be the minor fraction with 2.2 to about 3.2%. And there will be traces of hemoglobin F that's present. And also know that for your hemoglobin A, it is actually consisting of both hemoglobin A0 and also the A1, the glycated forms. So this is how the result would look like in the capillary electrophoretogram. So what are thalassemias? Thalassemias are the quantitative abnormalities. Okay? They are not opposed to the qualitative abnormalities, which are the variants, which I'm not talking about in this webinar. So for thalassemias, it's always about the quantity increase, uh, quantity decrease of the globin chains leading to the disease, right? And each of the different globin types could result in their respective thalassemias. Let's look at beta thalassemia for a start. In the instance of beta thalassemia, what happens is we have we know that we have lesser beta genes. There are two, and one of them uh, could be reduced in expression or deleted. It results in lesser beta chains being produced. So thinking about thalassemias, it's always important to think about the pairing of the globin chains. If you have a reduction of one globin chain leading to reduced pairing, then it, it will also mean that another beta uh, another globin chain is increased as a result, right? So always remember that quantitative difference between 
factors leading to differential pairing. So in this instance, there's reduced hemoglobin A, all right, and hence there's also more uh, extra alpha chains, which could pair with the other globins as well. However, also in beta thalassemia, we do see increased hemoglobin A2 and also increased hemoglobin F expressions. And the clinical manifestations would be low uh, MCV and also hemoglobin. Such instances, we regard it as a silence or a minor beta thalassemia. Here are some case examples of minor beta thalassemia seen in with capillary electrophoresis. So the hematological parameters are also present for these two patients. We can see that uh, they are partially they are partially problematic for the first patient, the 23-year-old woman, with a reduced MCV, all right? And, and you can clearly see in the result that hemoglobin A2 is increased. In the second case, it is a scenario where hemoglobin F is present and increased. Remember, in the normal profile, it will be in very trace amounts, and in this instance, it is increased, all right? And uh, this patient has more hematological uh, manifestations within the profile with reduced hemoglobin as well. How about in the more serious beta thalassemia context where two of the beta genes are being affected? So you do not have any beta genes anymore. And of course, in such an instance, hemoglobin A2 and hemoglobin F will, con will also continue to be increased. And such a patient will have a low MCV, low hemoglobin, but this is a major beta thalassemia trait. Let's look at the example of a case within capillary electrophoresis. So being a more severe condition, the patient would have more enhanced hematological parameters problems, like reduced hemoglobin and much reduced MCV. And you can see in this electrophoretogram that hemoglobin F is a predominant species, right? There's no hemoglobin A in this instance. So that's the beauty of the capillary electrophoresis, allowing you to see the, uh, to visualize fully all the spectrum pits. So a summary about beta thalassemia. In silent and minor beta thalassemia, you might not see any clinical signs that they are absent. They, are, they might at most only be moderate anemia. Uh, blood smears might be microcytic. Okay. Then uh, in terms of the hemoglobin electrophoresis, you would see hemoglobin A2 being increased slightly. Okay. For the intermediate beta thalassemia, you will see hemoglobin A being reduced and hemoglobin F being increased. Okay. And the increase of hemoglobin A2 can even go up to 10.5%. And of course, being a more severe disease, the clinical expression uh, would be more. Blood transfusion might be required as well. You know, of course, in major beta thalassemia situations, lifelong transfusions are required. Okay. In both instances of uh, intermediate and major, you will see microcytic anemia as well. And of course, for the major beta thalassemia, because there are no beta genes ex expressed, hemoglobin A is absent and hemoglobin F is increased more. So the clinical presentations of major beta thalassemia would come with uh, patients being pale, you know, irritability, because this involves the red blood cell function as well. So whenever the red blood cell shape is being affected, its removal by the body will be enhanced. So any, any form of abnormal red blood cell will always cause the body to have symptoms like hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. So basically the organs that are responsible for removing the red blood cells would be enlarged, right? And patients may have jaundice and developmental delay as well. And why the developmental delay? It has very much to do with because erythropoiesis is the, uh, conducted in the bone. So when that becomes problematic, it also affects the bone. And in such patients, there could be obvious facial 
bone stiffening. There are also secondary complications because of major beta thalassemia, and these are largely because of iron overload. Because these patients would need to undergo transfusion more continually. Let's look at alpha thalassemia. So as the term implies alpha thalassemia, there start to be a reduction of alpha genes, right? So there are more alpha genes for alpha genes, right? Creating like a more buffer for, for loss, in sense. So in any instance of reduced alpha genes, that uh, it will also uh, reduce the pairing with uh, the other globin genes. But in this instance, it may not be uh, that great an issue. Okay, because the condition is more minor assignment. So you have normal or borderline low MCV. Okay, the electrophoretic fractions might remain normal, and there's a silent alpha thalassemia. So how about a minor alpha thalassemia where you have two of the alpha genes with reduced expression? Okay, this will then uh, reduce hemoglobin A2 as a result. Okay. And because you have the excess globin chains, like for example, your gamma chains being expressed, and these excess gamma chains can self-pair to form your hemoglobin buds. In such patients, we see a borderline or low MCV. Okay. So hemoglobin A and hemoglobin A2 uh, could be either be normal or they could be reduced. Okay, so this is an instance of minor alpha thalassemia. So let's look at a case within capillary electrophoresis. So this patient's hematological parameters have reduced hemoglobin and MCV. Okay, it's also important to check the iron status to make sure that it's not a problem of iron deficiency, which is the leading cause of uh, anemia. Right, so when those iron reasons are removed, we can focus on the thalassemic reasons. So in this instance, this patient has the reduced hemoglobin A2. Right, so uh, we shows up, we shows up in the photogram. How about instances where more than two of the alpha genes are problematic and reduced in expression? You have a severely reduced expression of alpha genes in this instance. So remember that thalassemia is always a problem about pairing of globin chains. If you reduce the expression of one globin chain, it's going to lead to the excess of the corresponding pairing one. In this instance, it is felt in beta as well. So the extra beta globin chains will self-pair to form your hemoglobin H. Okay, there is also reduction in hemoglobin A2 because you have less alpha chains. And just like the previous sharing of the minor thalassemia, hemoglobin F, the extra gamma globin chains will self-pair to form hemoglobin buds. Of course, with increased severity, we can potentially see an increased quantity of hemoglobin buds. And for such a patient, the manifestation will be low MCV, reduction in hemoglobin A, reduction in hemoglobin A2. So in the instance when hemoglobin uh, H is being produced, you are able to also see it in one of the zones. So that, that gives us visibility to the alpha thalassemia. So in this instance, this patient has reduced hemoglobin, hematocrit, MCV, and also MCHC. Okay. The iron status are normal. So how do we conclude whether we can take the hemoglobin buds that's being identified in the capillary electrophoresis. Right. It is important for us to correspond it to the expression of hemoglobin F. So remember that if you do not have hemoglobin F expression, the hemoglobin part, buds pick most likely not be reliable. 
So always counter check your hemoglobin bar's expression back to the expression of hemoglobin F. So a summary on alpha thalassemia. Okay, so the condition can be can be very mild if you have only a loss of one alpha genes. Remember, your L, there are more alpha genes relative to beta genes, so it becomes like a buffer, right? So in an instance of the loss of one genes, you may not even see any clinical signs, but within the hematology, you can have slight microcytosis, right? So such are silent carriers. So if you have a more severe alpha thalassemia because of loss of more genes, in, in the case of minor alpha thalassemia, still the clinical signs are not significant. Although the hematological parameters may give you telltale signs about the condition as well. Okay, so it can, it can it could either be a homozygous uh, minor thalassemia or heterozygous one, depending on uh, which combination of the parental genes are affected. So in, in such an instance, uh, hemoglobin A2 values will be reduced. So in the more severe form of alpha thalassemia, it will involve the loss of three genes. And now the clinical signs will become more apparent. And within the capillary electrophoretogram, you can see reduced hemoglobin A, reduction in hemoglobin A2, Okay. Hemoglobin bats may be detectable. Hemoglobin H is detected. In the instance when all alpha genes are lost, this is actually a, a fatal condition when the baby is born. Okay. That's a hemoglobin bats hydrops fatality syndrome. Okay. So there, there will be severe hypoxia and expectedly death in utero. In such instances, because no alpha chains are produced, you do not have the normal hemoglobins. You do not have the hemoglobin F as well. Right? And hemoglobin bars will be the major hemoglobin peak. So in alpha thalassemia, looking at the increasing severity of the loss of alpha genes, this is the uh, reference range for hemoglobin A2 levels. Okay, you could see that many of them still fall largely within the overlapping ranges. But of course, in the major alpha thalassemia, this hemoglobin A2 level moves significantly away to a lower end. So in this instance, let's look at delta thalassemia. So the delta chain could be reduced in in production as well, okay, but this is a very uh, mild and insignificant condition. Because hemoglobin A2 is already in very small proportion, so you're expecting normal hematological parameters even in such a loss. And also in the sense where all the hemoglobin A2, uh, all the delta genes are lost, you also see normal hematological parameters because the hemoglobin a2 composition is too small, right? So it's important to pay attention to possible sources of misinterpretation. So in those zones where you see your hemoglobin bars or hemoglobin H, your zone char or your zone 15 respectively, it could be possible also that it could be a rare variant migrating in those zones. So it's important to verify the blood count and to see if the, the A2 levels are compatible with the alpha thalassemia. In instances of iron deficiency, it can also lead to a decrease of hemoglobin A2 and microcytosis. So it's always important to rule out the iron status influences before we look at thalassemia. So in instances of delta thalassemia, not so much that it's a problem, it can also lead to a decrease of hemoglobin A2. Okay, so it's important to not have that misinterpretation. It also boils now back to the patient's uh, clinical manifestations as well. 
the patient is pretty much doing well and asymptomatic, this is very likely the reason is it. It's also important to know that in young children, hemoglobin A2 is lower. Okay, if you look at this study and at the various age intervals of a newborn, you realize how significantly the hemoglobin A2 levels changes. And there's also a range, even if you are to look at the newborn at the same period of age. Okay. So th it's important to know the patient's age when you're interpreting the results. It's not just a case of looking at the foretogram, but also knowing the clinical background of the patient. So before the baby is being born, there's also a different composition of hemoglobin chains that are being expressed. So it's important to always remember these trends as well. So uh, before birth, the gamma chains are being expressed largely. So you have hemoglobin F being predominant hemoglobin, whereas hemoglobin A is not the predominant hemoglobin. However, it starts to increase in the, in the course of uh, development. While alpha chains, the alpha globin chains remains consistently expressed throughout life. So pretty much the problems that are pertaining to beta chains, we might only discover them later in life. Whereas for issues affecting alpha chain, we are more likely to see them uh, at a younger, uh, in the newborn phase, right? So note the difference between the electrophoretograms of both the newborn and the adults. Okay, so uh, once again, pay attention to the possible source of misinterpretation. Okay, so instances for iron deficiency Delta tansemia or young age can mask the increase of hemoglobin A2. Okay, importantly, also to note that hemoglobin A2 may be increased in uh, various vitamin deficiency situations. In such instances, it should not be mistaken for beta thalassemia. Right, so to, to do the additional measurements to rule out such possibilities. In very young children, hemoglobin F may also be high. Okay, so it's important to have the correct interpretation knowing the patient's age. Also, some other, uh, some other scenarios can increase hemoglobin F as well. For example, in hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F, also things like pregnancy can increase hemoglobin F. So very often when there is a situation of an increasing red blood cell production, like for example, in the course of pregnancy, you can potentially see hemoglobin F increase. Although that increase is not consistent to every uh, individual, right? So the hematological parameters of age and sex of patients are also necessary for correct interpretation. So what do we consider for elevated HBF? So if the hemoglobin F percentage is within one to five, and then if you have a normal hemoglobin A2 and your MCH is above 27, it, the possibilities would be some of these conditions, like diabetes, pregnancy, okay, hyperthyroid D, uh, chemotherapy, and some anemic stress. Okay, and potentially a moderated hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F. But if your hemoglobin F values are only high from 5 to 35%, and then there is reduction in hemoglobin A2, then uh, in such instances, let's say the hemoglobin F percentage is within 5 to 15%, we could potentially be looking at the heterozygous delta beta thalassemia. Okay. But if the MCH is normal, then most likely it's a case of the hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F. Okay, let's look at some case examples. So in this case, the uh, patient has normal hematological parameters, okay, but you see a hemoglobin A2 that's being reduced. Okay, so what could potentially be the problem? Be a heterozygous delta thalassemia. 
in which doesn't present significant clinical problems. In the second case, uh, we have normal uh, CVC for this patient. Okay, then uh, there's no, there's a normal hemoglobin A2 values, there's no detectable hemoglobin F. Okay, then you, then you actually see this BUD zone. So remember, in order to consider something as BUD, you always need your hemoglobin F to be expressed because you need the gamma change to be expressed in the first place. If they are, you will always see the hemoglobin but. So this is not the this is not a hemoglobin but and most likely it's, it is a rare variant. Okay. So in the third case, the uh, patients having normal hematological uh, parameters as well, but however you see a hemoglobin H zone that has a peak as well. Okay, so going back to seeing the hematological parameters and everything else normal, you can conclude that uh, it is likely a rare variant as well. Okay. So in this instance, the woman that's pregnant having uh, normal hematological parameters, you see a slight increase in uh, hemoglobin F. Okay, the hemoglobin F is increased because of pregnancy. And, and in this case, hemoglobin F is uh, greatly increased, but hematological param parameters are normal as well. Okay, so in such instance, it is a heterozygote hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F. Okay, so it is important to always ref uh, refer back to the hematological parameters and use it to guide your interpretation as well. With that, I uh, end my webinar and will welcome you to uh, ask questions. I would also like to invite you to uh, send your feedback through this link or through the QR code and appreciate your time for it.